This is the Balkan Adventures podcast. Everyday life and experiences in the Western Balkans. This podcast relies entirely on supporters who help to keep us sponsor and advert free through our community at patreon.com. You can pledge as little as $1 a month with early access to content and free giveaways. You will find a banner to our Patreon community on our website at balkanadventures.co. Thanks for helping us develop the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Balkan Adventures podcast, the podcast where we look at the positive side of the Western Balkans and especially Bosnia and Herzegovina. So no depressing stories about corruption, nationalism or any of that other rubbish here. In this episode, I catch up with Sheila Savanovic, who, I think, is the only Micronesian living in Southeast Europe. If I'm wrong here, then please drop me a message or an email and let me know. Sheila's story is one of adventure, and in every adventure, there are the ups and the downs. So let's crack on and meet Sheila Savanovic, a girl from the Pacific. This is the Balkan Adventures podcast. Okay, Sheila, let's start off. You're not from Banyuluka, you're not from the Balkans. In fact, you don't even come from Western, Northern or Eastern Europe. Where do you come from? I come from Micronesia, Micronesia, Eastern Pacific. The proper name is the Federated States of Micronesia, right? And it's in a massive ocean north of Papua New Guinea? Yes, right above Papua New Guinea and Australia, right somewhere below the Philippines. How the heck did you arrive here in Southeast Europe? That was, I I think... My calculations are right. Nine years ago, coming up my ten years actually, I studied in China, and that's where I met my husband, Vuk Savanovic. <laughs> so we studied together in China, and we decided after two, three years, we decided to move to Banyaluka. So this is now your home. It's home now. You can never change your home, but once you settle down and you get roots. Right now it's home. As far as I'm aware, there's 600 islands in total, but only a few of the big ones. Which is the one that you class as, as home? My, my dad is originally from the outer islands of Yap, whereas my mother is from, she's Chukis Ponpen. So that's like mainly, I'm from three of the islands in the Federated States of Micronesia. These islands, individually, do they have their own languages? Yes. Do they have their own cultures? They have totally different cultures. The lifestyle actually are just quite the same, but language and cult- culture-wise, they're totally totally different. You can't compare. The Appiz language, Chukis language, and the Pohnpein language, they are massively different. They have certain words that are similar, like coconut, Every everybody say nu, but everything else is totally different. So your linguist abilities then is the language of your mother, the language of your father, and English, and Serbian, yes, and Chinese, I take it. I, lear- I learned Chinese. I'm quite forgetting it, but if I practice some more, I'll get it. Yes, I learned Chinese for two years. Uh, what age did you end up leaving to go to, to China? That's really interesting interesting story. 21, 22, right out of college. I graduated from the College of Micronesia and during this time, this was in 2005 I guess, everybody was moving to the States. Okay, let's go to Hawaii. This is Micronesian, the Micronesian kids back home, they're all, let's go to Hawaii, Guam, the United States, let's go. Like That's where everybody was going. I was like, no, I want to try something different. I'm going to go east. <laughs> so I decided to go to China. And going to China was really difficult for me because I come from a very modest background I would say. Luckily they just started a program from the Chinese government started a program where they started inviting international students for a scholarship program and that's where I decided okay I'm gonna apply whatever comes comes and thank God I passed everything I was accepted and then I just had to work for my funds my ticket funds I did that for two years I collected enough funds and then I paid my own ticket and I went off to China. So you bump in to this Bosnian guy. Tell us, without giving out too much of the love story away, what's yours? My husband's name is Vuk. We were classmates, actually. We were first day of class. We introduced ourselves. It was okay. And uh, as the time passed by, we were actually best friends. We became best friends. We were, like, we were inseparable. Like, we were just, like, buddies. We were like, yo, cute bro, hey, sis. <laughs> you know, so that was the beginning. That was the beginning of our, our relationship. We were really quite good buddies. So he was studying the same as you? Yes, he, he came. Also, he was also on the international program. And we were dorm mates. We were classmates, we were party mates, we were just hanging out together all the time. For two years, we were really good friends. You know, some people have little problems, some have bigger problems. You know, when you're from two different cultural backgrounds, it can be quite scary. Was it scary for you? No, 
For me personally, no, it's not. I'm the kind of person that I would jump first before I think. I, I would jump into the, to the water first and then look around me afterwards to check if there's sharks, metaphorically. No, it's not. Life is not supposed to be easy. We were not born easy way. No, everybody's born the hard way. So personally, I think that's life. It's supposed to be hard. What matters more is how you accomplish your life, how you go about your life. But no, nothing. It was not difficult at all. This is the Balkan Adventures podcast. The first First day here, I was like, where the hell am I? It was snowy, it was dark. From Sarajevo to Banja Luka, we had to go around the mountains. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, where am I? <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? It, it was not really traumatic, but it was almost. So you drive through the dark, through the snow, the sun comes up the next day, and? I saw a lot of smokes. <laughs> Smokes, literally all the houses were smoking. <laughs> I was like, what are those? There's like chimneys. I'm like, you still use those here? <laughs> and then my mother-in-law, father, none of them spoke English. Here I am, a pregnant woman from Micronesia. I didn't understand anything anybody was saying. You know how the Balkans talk. Like it was, at the beginning, it sounds so aggressive. And I was like, why are you guys fighting every day? I was like, no, we're not fighting. <laughs> I was like, are you sure? Like, but then I laughed my way through it. My the first year here, I, la- I, I literally, I just laughed my way through everything. When did the language start to kick in? This aggressive, I don't know, I, I'll, I'll call it the former serbo creation Watch the comments that come in when I said that. Um, but yeah, when, when did that kick in? I, I, I also call it serbo coalition When people ask me, do you speak Serbian? I was like, yes, I do. What else do you speak? I speak Serbian, I speak Croatian, I speak Bosnian, I speak whatever language you want to call it, but I speak serbo croatian Yes, I do. My mother-in-law actually... To be honest, she taught me my servant. She, every day, she was like... I remember when I was, a couple of months after arriving, we were sitting in the living room, she was knitting some clothes, and I was lying, da- lying down, and then we just started counting away. She would say, Yedan, and I said, Yedan, Dva, Dva, and I would, everything, I would repeat after her. And I went a- after her, just repeating everything she said. And then whenever she, if she dropped something, she goes like, <laughs> And I would say, <laughs> And then she would turn and I was like, <laughs> So, like, I actually repeated everything that everybody said. Even, and then in our house, everybody curses. I think that's a normal thing here in the Balkans. Everybody just cursing away, like, whatever. And I, and I, I say it along with them. I don't curse at all. Like, I was raised in a very strict family. I don't curse at all but as soon as I come here, I guess it's just a part of the language so the, the first thing I learned were all the curses every single curses that you can come into mind I asked a lot of questions what is that word why why do you call it this where does the word come from like you know I'm just naturally curious when you bring up children and you said you came from like a background where you don't curse, do you protect them from that or have you just said you, you've just got to know it because you're going to grow up in the environment? My boys, they don't curse at all. They know. I tell them what is bad, what, what I expect in my house. First of all, I tell them it's my house. I lay down the rules. That's it. There's no cursing in my house. I mean, they're still young. They hear it every day, but then they would say, they would run to me and they would say, okay, Mama, 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 baba said this. <laughs> baba, mama said, okay, they, they said it, but that doesn't mean you can say it. So they know, like, right, at this age, they're, they're almost eight years old. Are they trilingual? They know Serbian perfectly. They understand English very well. They, they understand English, they speak English, but they don't know my mother, my Micronesian. They don't know any Micronesian language, which is sad. If you ask them, if they were here, and if you ask them where they're from, they'll tell you they're Micronesian.
you've had the boys the language is getting sorted out what was the next step after that was it I've got to look for a job or was it I'm going to be a stay at, stay at home mum what happened next the plan was going back to China that, that was the plan we'll go back to China because during this time China was stepping up in the world economy wise everything was so perfect in China and finding a job there was also very easy for us because we learned the language and we lived there for three years but then we moved back and then my husband was working in MTEL and this time MTEL was still at its high point so like it was pay the pay was okay you know so I was, okay let's when the boys grow up a little bit okay we'll probably move back but then when the the boys turned two years old I was okay let's find a job I can't just stay at home I need to work something and then I got pregnant again with my second pregnancy family's growing like I like I'm I want a big family I came from big family why not I gave birth to my to my daughter Katalaya and then she went through a very difficult time after birth like she contracted um, staphylococcus aureus from the hospital which is also a problem here our hospitals here are not very good sterile wise so she got sepsis which entered into her narrow her marrows and then for four years we were striving with her so I couldn't I, I was stuck in the home I was I couldn't she was very sick like all of our all of our daily lives were just around her but then, sadly, she couldn't make it. She, she passed away in 2016. Now, back in Micronesia, families would rally around to yeah, get to the... Yeah. Same, same here? Most of, most of the family members, they came by and they, they were there. My girlfriends, they, they took me out of it. But that's one thing I wanted to share. In Micronesia, after, um, let's say, the death of a family member, um, the first thing you do is you sing for 40 days, 40 straight days. People would come every night, they would sing, pass out cookie um, breads and, you know, coffees and donuts. And they would just hang around and just sing. You know, that it's singing is a very, um, it's a very a personal activity back home. Like, you just sing every time. We just sing in bad and good times. So here, after my daughter's burial, we came back home. And I took out my guitar and I started singing. Now that must have been yeah. a shock. Everyone was like, you know, like, what's going on? I was just like, oh, just drink coffee. And I just start singing away. And then people realize, no, oh, this is good. You know, like, you just sing and it's, it's, just, it's just a soothing process, I guess. And we were like, oh, okay, it's good. Did they join in? Or did they just sit there they shocked? Just, no, they were just sitting and listening because I was singing um, Micronesian songs. Uh -huh. Yeah, so we were just singing away all night. And then the rakia came out. And it's like, and people were like, you know, it feels like we're partying. It's like, yes, we have to. This, we're celebrating her life. This is the Balkan Adventures podcast. We're sat in this restaurant. So how did it come that Sheila arrives here? Yeah. One of my friends, her name is Dana. Dana, she's, she's I guess she's among the best artists in Banja Luka. Then she, she did the inter interior design, the paintings on the wall that you see here, all of the paintings around here, all the paintings around, she did all this painting. And while she was working here, I, I, I came out, I passed by, you know, you know, okay, while you're working, let's hang out. Like, sure, why not? So I came and I, I was like, what are you working? What is this? And she said, oh, it's, it's, um, it's a restaurant. It's a re new re opening restaurant, healthy food restaurant. It's like, do you know the owners? Like, yeah, I know. I'm working for them right now. I'm painting their restaurant. Of course I know the owners. Call them up. Ask them if they need worker. You did what? Yeah, I, I call the owners. If you know them, call them. Ask them if they need workers. I would like to work in their restaurant. She just and she called them. Up. She called Boris and Marina and she told them, "Oh, I have uh, my friend. Her name is Sheila. She's from Micronesia, and of course they don't know where that is. <laughs> she's from Micronesia, and she she's asking if you need workers. And as soon as they heard that, I was like, you know, I was like, I I, I have a I'm a darker I have a darker complexion. <laughs> They was like, oh, that would be really good. You know, so like, sure, why not? Next day I went to interview and then I was, I started working with them. This is the Balkan Adventures podcast. Looking around here, it, it, it is super modern. It's super European. If I didn't see that the menu on the, on the chalkboard was in Serbsky and if I didn't look out and <laughs> see the obvious Banja skyline of concrete, but it's amazing. Serving food that is quite, can I say anti-Balkan? I mean, it's not meat loaded no, for a start. For one thing, we have no red meat, red meat in the restaurant. We only have chicken and turkey, and of course seafood. Those are the only meats. And so a lot of people, when they come in here, they're just like, you don't have meat? I was like, no, but we have sarma, meatless sarma. <laughs> meatless sarma. Meatless sarma, you can see on the board. So Sarmageddon has actually come to, to Zen as well. <laughs> yes, I guess we're still introducing, you know, you know, like it's not only meat that you need to eat. You have other dishes that can supplement all the nutrition that you need for your body, which are not, not only meat. We have tofu, 
not a lot of people in the Balkans know what tofu is. Our customers, when they come and they ask, what is tofu? We have tofu burger. You have a burger without meat? Yes, it's called tofu burger. And we have to explain to them what tofu is. Like We have a lot of um, sweets that are also without eggs, with like they're veggie, without eggs, milk, non-gluten. They're still ad- adapting to it, and it's... It's coming along, I would say, well. It's very, like, we're really getting a lot of good customers and good comments about our meals. I was talking to the celebrity chef of Banja Luka, Predrag uh, mm-hmm. Tosic, about introducing new food. You know, somebody contacted me on YouTube and said, David, I'd like to open... He was from India, and he said, I'd like to come and open an Indian restaurant. I had to say... Um, wouldn't plan on doing that in the next five years because Predrag was telling me that people from Banja Luka and people from the wider Western Balkans are very, very reluctant to change. Yes. Having said that, when we came in here today to talk to you, you said, shall we go upstairs? And, and it was packed. On our really good days, people are just waiting outside. for, for You have lineup. Yes, we have lineup. But, and then we have people calling for reservations. Like, and then we'll say, okay, you can come in, but you have to wait for three, three seats. We have no three seats. Also, the good thing about this restaurant, we have a lot of kids who are allergic to gluten. We have non-gluten bread. We have non-gluten dishes. I would say we have a lot of things that people can get from us. So you're working here, you're front of house, but there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, making all these super dishes. How did that sort of like, or did it, or did it not affect you to get to the place where I saw you on television? How the heck did you get on a celebrity cookery show on television? One of my one of my call one of my colleagues. She actually she's she works in the kitchen. One of the cooks. She she told she asked me one day. Sheila, would you like to go on Look Illy Med? That's the name of television. I'm like, sure, why not? I don't, I didn't even know what that was until two weeks later. I realized that's a television show. It's like, what the hell? Are you crazy? I'm not gonna go on television. And she's like, let's go. Let's just go try it out. Ah, oh, what the heck? Let's go. Let's try it out. Whatever. We we actually just went on to have fun to have to do something different it was we didn't we didn't go for the money i mean susanna my colleague she was like yes we went for the money but i didn't i didn't went there i just went to try something different what was the experience like i mean cooking at home mm-hmm. cooking in a restaurant is one thing doing preparation yeah. and all the rest with all your neighbors and everybody else looking at you the stress must have been awful no <laughs> it's like no i was a born superstar i'm kidding <laughs> Uh, no, no, it was. I don't know. I just it's. I mean, that's nothing special. Like it's just. Un- well, it would be special to me if somebody <laughs> said, "Will you go and look, Illy Made?" One morning, I was walking to work actually, and right behind me was an older woman walking her dog. And I was walking. She was like, "Hey, Sine!" <laughs> hey, Sine! I was like, and I was like, "Okay, someone talking to me." And I looked back, and she was like, "Why are you on look, Illy Made?" I was like, "Yeah, I was." <laughs> I mean, Banja Luka is small. It's a very, it's a very small community. It's a very, I mean, it's a very, very small city. Everybody knows everybody. Like everybody watches the same. We don't have like a million of television shows. We just have alternative. It's, I mean, it's quite logical that everybody here would see. And I guess I'm not every day they see a Micronesian on their television. <laughs> so it was not quite an experience, but it was, it was okay. I laughed through it. <laughs> You've come halfway around the world with your husband, having met in China. Wow, that's an adventure. Then you come to a country where you don't understand the language, you get that right. That's another adventure. So now you've been a TV star. You work here in this restaurant. So what's next for Sheila? I don't know. We'll, I guess we'll go on the, that English cooking show you guys have there. What's the, what's the English the cook's name? What's his name? No, Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> You're not going to go into Devil's Kitchen. <laughs> That, that would be quite an adventure. Imagine him cursing every every single minute. I'll ah, but you like, could curse back with a J word. Like, oh, you! <laughs> I'm kidding. Who knows? Like, I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't really look ahead. I mean, yes, I do. What's going to be tomorrow? But I don't really. I don't plan. <laughs> I don't plan anything, which is which can be sounds stupid. Like you know, like you you know, you have to plan. You have to make it. You know, like. But no, I don't plan anything. I don't plan anything. But you are going to take the boys back home, as you said. What sort of preparation will you have to do? Because, you know, like when you arrived here in the snow and going, where have I come to? 
it could be a rerun in a way yeah. for them. Yeah, um, luckily they, they go to the seaside every summer. The boys, they go to Montenegro to the seaside with their grandparents every summer. So I don't know. But they watch, they watch, you know, they're eight years old. They go on YouTube by themselves and they actually go, to, they go through all the tropical islands in Micronesia. And every time they see like darker skinned people on YouTube, they're like, is he Micronesian? Like, you know, like, is this how they look? Is this how they dress? And I was like, I don't, yes, they are. I, I've introduced to them actually the islands and how it looks like the dance especially the dances back home like they would watch it and they're like oh wow like i want to dance i want to climb with you i want to do this it's like okay we'll you will you will get a chance they're actually excited about it they're excited about going to micronesia and it's like don't worry we're mommy's working on it <laughs> we're, we will go It's been really cool talking to you today. I, I, I think you're quite a, a brave woman to, to have done this. Go back 20 years to Micronesia. Where you are today must have been the furthest from your wildest dreams. I mean, I'm, I'm in Bosnia. <laughs> it's like to, just halfway around the world. I, I never saw myself coming to Europe. I always wanted to go to Greece still. Since fifth grade, I was always, you know what, I want to go to Greece, I want to watch, I want to see the Parthenon, I want to see everything, I want to go to Athens, Sparta, all that. Bosnia, it's not that far. <laughs> so I guess so to see myself in Bosnia 20 years ago, no. When you think of the future, and I know that you said that you live for today and you compartmentalize everything and, you know, life is and everything else. If you could have one dream, what would it be? I don't know, I just, just dream for good life for my children that's it i'm not saying that the life right now it's bad but a better a better life a better community that they don't go through the bad things that i went through for myself i don't dream about my for myself anything i i'm okay <laughs> how my life i'm okay i'm okay i don't complain about my life 
but just for a better life for my children. The truly adventurous story of Sheila Savanovic, a girl from the island of Yap in Micronesia who now lives a world away in Banyaluka, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thanks for letting me drop into your world. And for more stories from the Western Balkans, why not subscribe to the podcast through your favorite podcast player, whether that's Acast, Stitcher, Podbean, iTunes, or even YouTube. Until next time, please stay safe. To find out more about us and where we live, why not check out our blog at anenglishmaninthebalkans.com. See you next time.